Welcome to the Alpha Girl Confidence Podcast, where we are empowering youth female athletes to play and live confidently. My name is Shay Hatto, and each week I will bring you new episodes to teach you the strategies and tools that you need in order to live a confident, empowered life both on and off the playing field. Welcome back to the show. So on today's episode, I sat down with Lindsay Cortez, who is a professional sports dietitian, entrepreneur, and competitive runner. Lindsay is an expert in the sports nutrition industry, helping athletes to fuel their bodies the right way. She works with high school athletes, Division I college athletes, pro athletes, and she formerly served as the performance dietitian for special operations and U.S. military. In this episode, we dive into how female athletes should properly fuel around their menstrual cycle, what disorder eating is and how it affects not only athletic performance, but body image, and the biggest myths around sports nutrition. This episode is jam-packed with value for athletes, coaches, and parents, so get ready for an awesome episode. Enjoy. What's up, Lindsay? Thanks so much for coming on today's show. Super excited to have you, and you are the first guest of 2021, so thanks for coming on. I'm so excited to chat with you more and uh, share some info with your listeners. Yeah, I know I kind of already told you this as we were chatting before we hit record, but as I was doing research on you this week and this morning, I was like, man, like I'm really really excited to dive into this today, not only because I'm really interested in it, but because I think this will be super valuable for the players that are listening, no matter what age, and also, you know, the parents and coaches. So excited Mm -hmm. to dive in a little bit. Um, But before we do that, I want to know a little bit more about your athletic background and then kind of how that led you to, you know, doing what you're doing now. Sure. So, um, so child athlete kind of gymnastics was my my sport, my favorite thing to do. And, um, I made a decision in high school with gymnastics and certain sports, like you're kind of at that club level. Um, and I made the decision to compete for my high school team, which was a lower level. So, you know, around age 13, I realized, okay, I'm going to make this decision to kind of have the, the glory per se of competing for a high school team. And so I didn't necessarily progress more in gymnastics from throughout my high school career, um, but it was still my first love with sports and uh, what was kind of my primary sport. Although I did a little bit of everything. I did basketball, skiing, soccer was really big too. Um, and then since I did high school sports, I ended up doing track and field as well. And my senior year, I had pretty invasive surgery that kind of ended my gymnastics career. I was looking at some D3 gymnastics programs for college. And then when I had that surgery, it was going to be really difficult for me to get back into gymnastics specifically. It was on my stomach. So like bending and flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. So running, I was also really succeeding at, um, and I was, you know, using my strength and power from gymnastics and I did hurdles. I did pole vault, I did sprints. And so I was able to actually compete at the D1 level in track and field. I went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst and I competed track and field for all four years. Um, and then kind of into adulthood, what's interesting is running is now like my main passion, but I was a sprinter and now I do distance running. So I've just been all over the place. Um, so now I'm, you know, I love trail running. I love marathons, half marathons. So running is kind of where I find the most enjoyment in my sports right now. Yeah. And you you kind of noted, like you do, you did all these sports when you were younger. So was, was track and field kind of just like this, like back burner sport where it was like trying to get you ready for all these other sports, or was it one of your primary sports from the get-go? You know, sort of, I did like a summer track league when I was like 10 or 12 or something. And it was like, you know, cause I prioritized gymnastics and soccer at that age, but it was just something kind of fun to do. And I think that's, what's really cool about track and field is you, no matter what type of athlete you are, you can find an event in track and field. You know, if you're a volleyball player, you can do the high jump in track, right. you know, like there's, I did long jump for a while too. Um, you know, cause of gymnastics, again, it's like, I was used to running down the runway and then vaulting and springboarding myself. And so transitioning to long jump was really easy. So I think that's, what's fun about track and field is whatever type of athlete you are, you can find an event in there and then specialize in it. So in a sense, it kind of was a a back burner until probably like junior in high school. Um, I think that's when I started um, 
winning some titles, like in my divisions and in my, in my league. And that's when it was like, oh, I'm, I'm good at this. And so then it became more of a priority. Okay. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like as a soccer player, my whole life and like as a soccer coach, like it's so funny. Cause I'll have my athletes be like, well, yeah, I'm going to do track or I'm going to run cross country during my off season just to like keep me in shape. So I think a lot of players see it as like this, you know, sport to really keep you in shape. But I like how you said, like you can find anything. Like I hated running, like still do. I still hate running to this day. But when you said like the high jump, I'm like, man, I think I actually could have succeeded in like a track and field event. So yeah, that's like something that I never thought about, but I wish I would have maybe tried something now that you said that. (laughs) Well, you know, there's adult leagues, so. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm way past do any of that stuff. So I'll just stick to what I know now. Um, (laughs) So I know like in your kind of like reading and about you and what you do, you, you worked with, was it the air force at one time? Mm-hmm. So what yeah. did you do with them? Cause I want to kind of get in, you worked with, uh, it was like all male population, correct? Mm-hmm. So what, yeah. I guess, what, it, what are the biggest like nutritional needs and differences between male athletes and female athletes? Yeah. So there's, there's actually a lot. And I think we've known for a while, like men and women or girls and boys like respond differently. And I think in like a societal standard though, women and girls feel bad about themselves for doing that. It's almost like, you know, the men who can follow this diet or lose weight, or they have a six pack or a 12 pack. Um, and if they're eating a certain way or training a certain way, it's like, that's considered like right in the gold standard. And then women and girls are feeling like they are not good enough or not seeing the same results and feeling bad about that. And the truth is, you know, we have different needs and we have different hormones. We have different metabolisms. We have different times of the month when our body is responding differently to nutrition and to training. And a lot of the research that we have in the field of nutrition and and just the science field, quite -hmm. quite frankly, like all science, um, exercise science as well, it's all done on men Mm. and it's done on men. You know, the excuse is because men are easier to study because they don't have all these hormone fluctuations and they don't have menstrual cycles. So they're easier to study, but then you can't actually apply that science to a woman or a girl going through puberty when it's completely different hormones. So You know, some, some of the major things that stand out to me, Shay, are like um, just how our bodies process and utilize carbohydrates, what an appropriate um, amount of weight change would be throughout puberty, throughout a lifetime, what expected body composition changes might be. Um, it's all very different for women. Yeah. And with kind of going into like, you know, the menstrual cycle, what what kind of different nutritional needs do we need in all of our different phases of our, of our menstrual cycle? Mm, Really good question. And by phases, you mean like somebody who has a menstrual cycle or even like somebody going through puberty? Cause that's another stage too, right? Let's hit them both. Let's do the puberty first. Cause I have a lot of, I mean, I know their majority of the listeners are middle school, high school athletes. So a lot of them are going through puberty. Yeah. Yeah. So the difficult thing is that at this time in, in their life is probably when they're starting to become more conscious of their bodies in general, they're starting to maybe get a little more serious about their sport and think, how can I fuel my body to be a better athlete, which should be a good thing. Um, but it's also a time where girls can be really susceptible to body image and changes and where they first get influenced by dieting and eating healthier. And so what you need as you are going through puberty is you need to be giving your body enough energy and enough nutrition to support growth and development. And this is growth up. This is growth out. This is growth in your bones. Um, this is growth in fat mass, whatever it might be really giving yourself enough energy. And unfortunately it's the time where I see so many girls start to restrict themselves. And so they can 
delay their development, delay their bone density. We see a lot of high school athletes that end up getting stress fractures and chronic injuries. And it's because you're not using nutrition to support your growth. So I think that's the most important thing that I really want to stress for our middle school and high school athletes. Yeah. And with that, do you see more often, um, you know, girls and going through puberty, do you see them more often, um, under fueling as opposed to over fueling? I do. I do. And, you know, as a dietitian, I don't want to ignore the fact that, um, America does need some healthier nutrition habits, but especially those young girls that are participating in sport, I see a lot of under fueling and we really want to reframe our mindsets to not thinking about, you know, eating less, but more so eating to fuel your body with good nutrients that support your activity and that support your growth and development too. Okay. So let's kind of talk then someone who, who does have their period, what during, during those five, seven days, what kind of different nu- nutrition requirements or what should we be eating differently? How does that change during that phase? Okay. So the interesting thing is when you are actually menstruating. So that week of your period, um, that this is kind of a, this is a, a mind blower if you haven't heard this before, <laughs> but this is actually when hormonally your body is in, um, tip top shape to train at your highest level. Um, because actually, yeah, estrogen and progesterone are their lowest. So your ability and, and testosterone is kind of at its highest as well. So your ability to lift heavy, to sprint fast, to run far, um, to be really competitive is actually the best during that time. So again, this is a culture shift. We've been told our lives as girls and women that periods suck. And as an athlete, I actually want you to embrace that. This is your time to get after it. Um, And so from a nutrition perspective too, this is that time where kind of um, your body's really utilizing everything you put into it and, and you can utilize it to perform at your highest level. Um, it is the week before that, what we call our PMS phase. Um, it's kind of our luteal phase, the second half of our cycle. That's when estrogen is highest, which, um, one issue with estrogen being high is it interferes with their body's ability to break down carbs. Mm So because of that, uh, your performance might not be so great because carbs actually fuel your performance. And so if you are trying to perform at your highest level, if you have a game, if you're trying to hit a PR during that week, you actually might need more carbs so that your body has energy readily available. Um, and a lot of women feel this because you feel I'm having cravings. How come I'm craving chocolate? Right. (laughs) Must be PMSing. Is my period coming? And instead of fighting against that, again, society will tell you that's a bad thing. Don't give into the chocolate cravings. It's actually kind of nice to realize, hey, you know, this is a time where my body is really struggling to break down carbs. And so I want to be mindful of my choices, but I'm also, if I'm going to exercise, I'm going to train at a high level. Let me be intentional on giving my body extra carbs and satisfying those cravings because my body's asking for it. Yeah. I like, I totally would have thought, like, I feel like I've been taught my whole life too, that and I don't know where, like if, where I heard this, but that during your period, you're supposed to be a little tired and you're supposed to be like, oh, I have cramps. I don't want to go to practice. And like, and I've even had players like be like, I'm on my period. Like, I don't feel good. I'm not going to train today, you know? And so I, I, I feel like that as well. So it's good to hear that, like, that's actually when our bodies are at our best. Um, and I think that, it might just even be a mindset shift. If we tell ourselves that we're tired, then you're going to be tired. But if you tell yourself your body is at its highest, then you're probably going to see those effects. I absolutely agree. And now some people like the cramps and bloating and stuff like that, um, that's going to vary person to person. They're usually at their highest right before your period starts, but sometimes Mm -hmm. it does trickle into the first few days. Um, so take care of yourself. If that is the case, you know, use heating pads, you know, sleep in a couple extra hours, but if you can do that mindset shift and say, all right, let me, let me get to practice. Once you get moving, your body can actually respond well. And, you know, going back again to that, uh, premenstrual phase. So the week before your period comes in addition to estrogen being higher, progesterone is higher and progesterone is one of our biggest catabolic hormone. So this is a hormone that really breaks things down. And so, um, break down muscle 
is kind of a big thing for athletes. So you might be a lot more sore the week before your period. You might feel like, how come I'm not like, I'm just, you know, I don't have that quick speed in my feet. Um, my muscles just like aren't responding how I want them to, or if it's in the, in the gym, you might just not be able to put up certain weight because you have more progesterone and it is limiting your body's ability to recover as fast. So during that time, you know, nutritionally, you might want to bring an extra emphasis on some protein or just some more good recovery habits to take care of yourself. And if you take care of yourself the week before your period, then the week of your period, you have that mindset shift of this is my week to get after it. Right. Um, you really set yourself up for success. So it's really exciting. Yeah. I, get I wish, yeah, I was <laughs> just thinking like, man, I wish that I would have known this when I was competing because mine was totally, my mindset around it was totally flip-flopped, right? And mm -hmm. I, I, going maybe a little bit off topic, but just curious, and I don't know if if this is necessarily your expertise or not, but is it true that, that female athletes are more likely to be injured um, during their period? Um, so I would say, again, it's more likely the, the PMS, the premenstrual okay. yep. week, because progesterone is higher. Okay. Um, and then we do have some like fluid shifts as well. So you could think about like lubrication of the joints might not be so great. So it is more that the week before your period. Okay. Um, and again, there's, a, there might be a little bit of crossover a day or two, but right. okay. yeah. so pretty much that week before is kind of the low, um, period for a lot of things. Yeah. And I would say if, if you are in control of your own training schedule and things like that, then to be mindful of that, incorporate more rest days or have that be kind of a, a deload type of training week. And if you're on a team where it's completely up to the coach, you know, have that discussion about how you're feeling um, and just have that discussion or set, set the expectation as well for how you're feeling and how that might match with how you're playing or performing that week. Yeah. And I know like during the world cup, um, the, I think it was maybe the strength coach who was kind of, they used a, an app. I can't remember the app. I actually downloaded it at one time, but I they think you know, it's called fitter woman. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, I actually downloaded So they use that to kind of track each player's menstrual cycle to kind of probably nutritionally wise, their training load, everything like that. So, you know, I thought that was interesting. And I feel like that's the first time that like a big sports team, maybe not, but the first one, at least I heard of, of them actually tracking on an individual level to kind of see like what their load should be and everything. So, yeah, yeah, they, they absolutely were one of the first teams because again, what's really cool about this is, you know, nutrition, it actually is a new science. And like you said, you know, for so long, we've been taking all this nutritional science and whatever's been worked for men just assumed it's going to work for women. And this has really only been booming in the last like five, 10 years of finally some researchers were like, wait a second, why aren't we researching women? <laughs> I forgot <laughs> so, about us. <laughs> yeah. So right. it is, it is new science. And, um, I would say, you know, jump on it. If, if you can start applying yeah. some of this, because, you know, you and I weren't, we didn't know this 10 years ago. No, I didn't know it. Like all of this five minutes ago. <laughs> to be honest. Thank so thank you. That's why I was excited to have you on. It's great. Um, so let's kind of shift gears a little bit and I want to go into kind of disorder eating a little bit and red, do you pronounce it red S? Is that how it's said? Yes. Okay. Red so I want to first like hear your story with, cause I know you mentioned in, in college and maybe in high school a little bit too, that you kind of struggled with eating disorders or whatever you want to call it, but tell us your story as it relates to, to that and your journey. Of course. So I first want to start by saying that, um, when I was an athlete or really my whole life, I would have never resonated with the term eating disorder. Um, in fact, I probably would have put up a brick wall and been like, yeah. Oh, well, you know, that's not me or whatever. And some people do resonate with that, but I think in the athletic field, you know, we don't because we are trained to assume that, you know, along with your passion for your sport comes this regimen with your nutrition or your diet and comes expectations out of your body. And so for me, um, I never resonated with disordered eating, eating disorder because I was just an athlete. Um, so for me, what that looked like was in high school at a very you know young age, I started counting calories and this was before the time of smartphones and fitness trackers. So I don't even know where I learned this info from, but I just did. Um, 
And at that time in high school, it wasn't necessarily a problem because again, I had that athlete mindset of, you know, this is just my regimen. This is, I'm, um, you know, how I get my body in shape and stuff like that. In college, what ended up happening to me is um, I felt a lot of pressure just to fuel perfectly and to maybe have a specific body image. And then when I got injured um, and I couldn't train at the level that I wanted to, my exercise decreased. And so the only way I could control my body shape was to decrease my food, which became unsustainable because you can only decrease your food so much until you are angry, irritable, hangry, miserable, hungry, like just, you know, and so, and then it led to some other just bad behaviors and a bad relationship with my body and food. Um, so that's kind of my personal story. And, you know, to be honest, Shay, I don't think that my story is uncommon. So many people struggle with it. I don't think it's uncommon at all. Like uh, just the term like eating disorder, I think people are like, Whoa, like they kind of, like you said, maybe put a wall up, yeah. um, you know, and it's like, Oh, I don't have that. Or I don't want to talk about that if, if I do, or maybe not even realizing that they have it mm-hmm. or that they're struggling with disordered eating. Um, but for you, when you were kind of going through that, how did it affect, um, your performance physically, but also mentally? To be honest, I'm going to say for me, it mostly affected me mentally because it affected my confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt, you know, at a track meet, I'm at the starting line. And instead of thinking about performing and about my race, I'm looking at people's bodies and I'm feeling insecure about mine. Yeah. Was it a lot of comparison? Yeah, it was, it was comparison, but it was also, so this is an interesting thing, Shay, that I see a lot, especially in the clients I work with. It's not just comparison to other people, but comparison against myself and my former self, Mm -hmm. you know, your body changes so much between middle school to high school. And then from high school to college, I just had this conversation with my clients last night, actually, um, in just accepting the fact that your body is meant to change. And if you're competing at the college level, still looking like a high schooler, you're actually not going to keep up. Right. right. Like it's a different level of competition. You need to allow your body to change. But that was something that I struggled with. Wasn't just comparing my body to other people's bodies, but comparing my body to my former body. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. just a few years ago or from maybe when I did do a different sport or something like that. Um, so really just coming to acceptance of, you know, what are bodies supposed to look like and how are bodies supposed to change and keeping the focus on performance throughout all of that. Yeah. And like you, we kind of alluded to, like, I, it's probably a lot more common than, than we know. Right. So if, if there's a girl listening that maybe she's getting pressured from coaches, from parents, um, from friends, whatever, to look a certain way, what advice would you give to her as far to, as how, how, how to handle that pressure? Hmm. Well, definitely is, is to focus in on yourself and focus on how you can perform at your highest level and how you can fuel your body to give energy to perform at your highest level. Because if you are going through any drastic measures or reducing your energy to try and change your body shape or size, um, your body is now not functioning at its full capacity. And if, you know, to really challenge your, your coach or whoever you might be feeling that pressure from as well, if they're saying, you know, oh, you know, get leaner, get lighter, you know, well, why coach, you know, how I'm running great right now. I'm performing great. Like, you know, I have one of the strongest kicks on the team, whatever it might be. And, uh, bring some light to all the positive ways that your body is performing and keep that focus on yourself. I love it. I love it. So I I want you to shed a little bit of light on the term of like disordered eating or eating disorder. Like what does that really mean? Or what does that really look like? Yeah. Um, so, you know, eating disorder, I suppose is more of a clinical term and there are, Uh you know, clinical things that would define that as well. But I, I also want to, um, remove the, 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 policy, I guess that an eating disorder would only happen to somebody who's like in a hospital or something like that, because 
there are athletes actively competing who are still struggling with it. Um, but, but typically those are things that we're seeing a lot of physical concerns, um, with, with those eating disorders and then disordered eating. I mean, that could be anywhere on the spectrum. Um, oh, right. It could, it could be you engaging in some unhealthy habits of restricting your food sometimes of the day, but then overeating other times of the day, feeling out of control around food, feeling like you need to control food and count every calorie and every gram. Um, or it could just be, I see a lot of people that, you know, have disordered eating because they, in this perpetual cycle of feeling like they need to be on a diet, but then they fall off their diet. And then they're like, I can get back on my diet. And then they fall off their diet. You know, that's like a very, uh, roller coaster type relationship with food instead of having consistency. So, I mean, I, I could call that disordered eating and the term that you mm -hmm. said before red S that stands yeah. for. Yeah, that stands for relative energy deficiency in sport. Okay. And this is kind of a new term coined by the um, International Olympic Committee. Uh, just in 2014, they coined this term, although, of course, it's been going on right. for years. Um, but what this is, is it really uh, highlights how not having enough energy can affect you. And of course, it's not having enough energy relative to your sport and your exercise. So like the old way of thinking is calories in should match calories out. Right. But that's really not true because uh, calories out is only one part of the equation. Um, you need to have calories in to support all of the internal work that your body's doing, like make hormones, build bones, um, keep your core body temperature warm, grow hair. Like those are all right you know, that internally your body needs to do. And what we see in athletes is when they aren't getting enough energy compared to how much they are expending in their sport. The crazy thing is that your body prioritizes your sport. And so, you know, cause you're out on the field, your body's like, yeah. well, like you know, I got to suck this up. I got to pull the energy from somewhere. So it pulls energy from all those internal things. And this is where girls start losing bone density. They start getting injured more often because their muscles aren't recovering well, their hormones drop, their hair starts falling out. They have, you know, dry skin or they're super irritable. They're not, you know, focusing clearly. Um, just getting, having like impaired judgment and, you know, mm -hmm. being clumsy for a lack of better term. It's like, okay, I can, you know, perform great on the field, but off the field, I'm tripping left and right because, like mm. internally, your body is kind of shutting down in all these other areas. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I would imagine that that's pretty common. Would you say that's like a really common thing that a lot of people aren't even really aware is that's affecting them? Yeah. So it, whether it's red S disordered eating or eating disorders, I mean, we have lots of statistics that show, you know, one out of three high school girls, one out of four wow. NCAA athletes are struggling with some combination or, or, you know, all of these things at once. And sure. do you see it more prevalent in, in other sport in like one sport over other sports, or is it kind of across the board fairly equal? I've definitely seen it in all sports. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's immune to it. Right. Um, I think it is a little bit more common in some, um, aesthetic sports, so right. dance, gymnastics, any weight-based sports. So crew and rowing, even MMA, we're seeing lots of issues there. Mm -hmm. It's weight class sport wrestling and then, um, endurance sports as well. So long distance running cross country, you know, cycling, we see it very, it's very common in those. And, you know, part of it is just the culture that have been built around those, those sports. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Well, so let's say that someone listening is like, wow, like, I think I actually might, you know, have some disordered eating habits. Um, what is, I guess the first step they could take to start overcoming that? Yeah. Um, hmm. I should have thought of this before coming on your show. Cause it's really <laughs> easy question. Uh, there's so, there's so many steps to take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start with the, the best thing, which would be yeah. probably to find a, a professional, you know, like a registered dietitian like myself yeah. and, 
in addition to a registered dietitian, I am a sports dietitian. So understanding that from a sports perspective, um, this is different than just a nutritionist or a personal trainer who might be giving out nutrition advice or an online influencer. So I would, I would advise you to be very cautious about, you know, when I'm online, you know, you're online, right. there's no issue with being online, but the difference between a, you know, nutrition influencer versus a, a credentialed provider, um, so first I would, I would say that, um, the second thing I would say is, is a mindset shift of, you know, to stop thinking about, you know, eating less or, or dieting, or even the term healthy, we can somehow take yeah. to an extreme and just think, how can I fuel? How can I have balanced nutrition and fuel my body to give myself energy throughout the day, energy for my workouts and recover well afterwards. And, you know, sometimes fueling means like I'm exhausted. I need some pasta. And sometimes fueling means I need to get some more fiber in my system. I need to have a salad, you know, both can be appropriate, but just knowing that, you know, you don't have to eat a salad because you think it's healthy. Um, you have to kind of tap into giving your body energy and putting good fuel in it throughout the day. Yeah, absolutely. And then along with, um, kind of very related, right. Is disordered eating and body image. Right. So like in your experience, um, how difficult is it to change someone's body image and also while they're dealing with disorder eating, like, do you see that a lot? Oh yeah. All the time. And, and it has to be done together. Yeah. You know, cause I, if, if you fix one, but not the other, then that's not the full solution. Um, so it, it should be done together. And fortunately, you know, as you are, are healing from disordered eating and finding how to fuel your body, you're going to start feeling better. And if you feel better, you're going to have more confidence in your body. If you feel better, you start performing better. If you perform better, you're going to have more confidence. So it really helps. Sure. There. Yeah. And if, you know, but also vice versa, you can work on your, your confidence as well. And that's going to help you overcome those limiting beliefs and fears that you have that are holding you back in, in these disordered eating mindsets. So working on your right. confidence and your mindset is going to help you overcome whatever nutrition struggles you might be having. Right. And I'm sure a lot of the time the negative body image is perhaps a cause of the beginning of disordered eating. Would you say? It can be. And, you know, I shared a little, my, you know, my story, as I already shared with you, it started with just the drive to be a good athlete, but then it, yeah, it did kind right. of morph a little bit because when I couldn't be the great athlete that I thought I was because I was injured, then it became about my body. And so definitely starts there, but there's, there's lots of reasoning these things start, you know, sometimes it, I see a lot of the drive to be an athlete. I see the comparisons, the body image. I see the uh, trauma it can definitely be trauma related, insecurities, bullying. Mm -hmm. There's um, so much that could go into it. And I also don't want to ignore the fact that, you know, when it comes to a clinically diagnosed eating disorder, it is considered a, a mental health um, disorder. Yeah. And so, you know, there's some research in that area too, or, you know, are some brains a little bit more susceptible, you know, this is a big thing with our confidence that I'm sure you preach to your, your girls all the time too, you know, is, you know, just because somebody is saying something, you know, you have, you can choose to believe it or not. And so some brains might be more susceptible to certain things and certain topics, but to take back ownership of that. Um, I love that. Yeah, yeah. It really is about taking ownership of, it. and like you said, like you, you get to choose what you allow in and what you don't allow in. Right. I love that. So when you were in college, then as far as the, the pressures that you had to deal with, with, you know, coaches and, and teammates and stuff trying to make you look a certain way or perform a certain way, how did you handle the pressure um, as far as both on like a, a physical standpoint and a mental like perspective? Um, not well. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good for our listeners to hear, I guess we should say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I personally, those pressures were mostly all internal. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, I, I wasn't on scholarship. I wasn't, so I wasn't getting pressures, you know, was, and some athletes that go through that, they experience things at a whole nother level, but this was all internal and I kept it all internal as well. I don't think any one of my college friends that are hearing me speak out about these things now had any clue 
Mm. I kept it all internally. So I don't think that was the right way. Also, you know, I was studying to become a dietitian. So that was again, another internal pressure of like feeling like a fraud with like, how can I be struggling with this when this is like what I'm supposed to be good at? Um, But so what happened, you know, for me personally was just um, exposing that side of me that felt like an imposter and felt like a fraud and just saying, you know what, I, you know, if this is something I'm really passionate about, something I really want to do, if I really, you know, love food and want to help people be healthy, then I need to actually start doing that myself. And, um, you know, I started doing things differently. If you need to want to make a change, you know, then something's got to change. So it meant, you know, I'm not counting calories anymore. It meant I'm, I'm going to let myself gain weight. I'm not going to stop trying to gain weight because for so long I was trying to prevent that. And, and I just let myself do that. And it was difficult and it was hard. And I had a bit of a like identity shift as well. But in that process, I found, um, what was more important to myself, my confidence, my happiness. And in that process, I fueled my body better. I healed my injuries. I reset my metabolism and my hormones and, you know, in time, that's exactly what helped me become a great athlete as an adult. Like it's, it's terrible. Right. I'm like, Oh, if I could go back to college now, I would crush it. <laughs> you know, right. My body is in it so much healthier and stronger and fitter now than it was back then because I'm actually treating it. Right. Yeah. And like all of the stuff you've been through where you said you didn't handle it well, like that's what's helped you to be so good at what you do now. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, like, uh, I think it was like make your mess, your message. Like I was horrible at confidence. Right. And so we, we took the thing that we struggled with and now we're helping other people with it. So I think that that makes you, you know, even more influential and and be able to make even more of an impact. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, so nutrition is like very, you can find a million different, like pieces of advice from, you can go crazy, like trying to figure out what's right and what's not right. Right. So mm-hmm. with that being said, like, what are some of the biggest myths that you see, um, as it relates to how female athletes should fuel for competition? Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the things I've already hit on because I'm very passionate about this and so many people struggle with it, but one of the, the biggest myths is that you should be eating lighter or eating super healthy all the time. And trust me, I care about health. Don't right. get me wrong. I care about health, but to only eat those quote unquote healthy foods all the time to only to really focusing on salads and fruits and vegetables and lean proteins all the time, you actually might be missing out on some essential fats. You might be missing out on those carbs that you need to fuel your performance um, and be more energized. You might be missing out on small nutrients, vitamins and minerals. You know, if you're going vegan because you assume that it's supposed to be healthier for you, you're missing out on B12 and iron and calcium. And those are huge for athletes. So, um, Oh, I just jumped around a lot, but that's a, that's a myth is that you, you know, should be, you know, focusing on only those healthy foods all the time. Um, having, having more diversity and even breaking down, you know, what is considered a healthy food, you know, pasta and pizza could be, you know, some really carb energizing carb loading foods right before a big game or a big match. And it could be exactly what you need as an athlete. Yeah. Uh, and I think when, when athletes think, oh, I got to eat healthy, it's like, well, what, what does that really mean? And then it's almost just like paralysis by over analysis, right? It's like, yeah. well, and then they just go, go crazy because they don't know what to do. Right. So I, I love that you just said, you know, like you have to add in things, like you said, pizza can be great for a game or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's super, super helpful. What other, is there any other like big myths that you see, um, yeah. That yeah, for sure. You know, another myth is that you should be on like a lot of supplements, um, yeah. or, or even that, you know, you should be taking a multivitamin or something like that. Um, you can get everything you need from foods. In fact, you should get everything you need from whole foods. Um, having extra supplements in my opinion, it's, well, it's, it's that it's to supplement your diet and your nutrition. So, um, and it should probably only be used during a time in your life where you're trying to overcome something. So, you know, if you, mm, you yeah. have an injury or, you know, or you are anemic, like, yeah, we need some supplements to help get you back to, you know, baseline, but then food should be providing you all those necessary nutrients. And if it's not, if you're relying on supplements, um, that's where you actually need to take a look at your nutrition and make some changes there. 
Okay. Awesome. So let's get really, really tangible. So I want to know like whether it was when you're in college or right now, like what is your like go-to pre-competition meals or snacks for the day? Okay. Well, for me personally? Yeah. I want to know. Okay. Um, so since I run right now, if this is before a race, which, uh, varies in length and duration, but I'm straight carbs. So I'm like, you know, a bagel, maybe with a little peanut butter with banana with some OJ or Gatorade, like straight carbs, because it settles in my stomach, uh, really easily, right. Too many proteins or fats or fiber would might upset your stomach. So straight carbs, give me the energy and I'll focus on my proteins and my salads after the race, <laughs> after go. the game, you know? Um, yeah. So I love bagels. I love frozen waffles because they're quick and easy. So frozen waffles with some, you know, honey on them or something and some berries, some fruit, um, and then toast, good old toast. Oh, You're Cereal. making me so hungry right now. This is my life every day. <laughs> okay. So let's say, cause I, I feel like a lot of athletes struggle with this. If they have like an evening game, um, mm-hmm. like how should they fuel throughout the whole day leading up to that? I actually just talked to one of my clients about this last night, uh, who's also a soccer player and like her practices are super late, like seven 30 wow. to nine o'clock at night. Um, I know that's hard. <laughs> yeah. So understandably your pregame meal, uh, like I just mentioned, you, you do want to focus on those carbohydrates. Um, the visual image that I give to my clients is if you imagine your, your plate, you know, like a circle, um, to have at least half of it be carbs. So whether that is, you know, the pasta, rice, cereal, um, something like that. Mm -hmm. So half of your plate being carbohydrates, a quarter of your plate being some protein and a quarter of your plate being color, meaning fruits or veggies. So if this is a nighttime game, you know, having half your plate be pasta with about a quarter of your plate chicken and a quarter of your plate, some broccoli is giving you a good balance of nutrients, but still giving you mostly those carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. um, which will help you throughout the game. And then you can focus you know, your other meals throughout the day, your breakfast, your lunch, and your snacks on getting more well-rounded or being a little more flexible, I suppose, having some, some more fats in that meal, you know, still trying to get all those components in of carb, protein, color, some healthy fats, but, um, having the pregame meal, just focus on those carbs a little bit more. Cool. And then also a question I get a lot too. So let's say they are having that plate that you described with, um, you know, spaghetti or whatever you said, chicken and broccoli, right? Like that's a fairly big meal. So how early, and I know everyone's different. Everyone likes to eat different times before, but generally like what range should they eat that bigger meal before a a competition? Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody is different, but three hours before works to, and two, if you, if, if you can handle it, I guess I would say, but two to three hours before is a great time for your pregame meal. And then if you need a little pick me up, um, whether it's, you know, a half hour before stepping out for your warm up, or maybe even between warm up and the game, um, that's where, you know, some orange slices or some Gatorade or some, you know, sports shoes or something like that will give you a little pick, pick me up right before the game. But at least you've got your full meal that has had, you know, two to three hours to digest. Perfect. Yeah. That's what my, I was always about three hours and then had some snacks kind of leading up right before. So that's perfect. Um, and then what about like, so for sports that have halftime, so not track and field, but I guess in between events, right. Yeah. Is it important? Would you say for like, let's say a 90 minute soccer match or a basketball game or something to eat something, a little something at halftime? I think so for sure. And, and definitely everybody's, um, playing time varies, but if you are one of those athletes, you know, doing a 90 minute soccer game for sure. Halftime is key to refueling. You're going to feel the difference and your coach is going to notice your improvements and your stamina and your endurance throughout the second half of the game. So again, I know I keep, I'm pressing the carbs right now, but, (laughs) but, you know, because that's what you're actively using and that's what doesn't upset your stomach. Um, like I said, the proteins, the fibers, the fats take longer to digest. So, uh, you know, if you're doing orange slices, Gatorade, some fruit gummies, I I used to love just, yeah, fruit gummies at halftime is perfect. A small granola bar. Um, it can be something homemade to some like oatmeal energy bites or something like that. Um, and it's, you know, think of it as, as your fuel, this doesn't have to be a snack or anything Mm -hmm. because you don't want to 
don't want to make yourself feel bad by, by having too much food in your stomach to where right. you know, you're feeling it in the second half, but how can you give yourself a boost of energy, a little bit of fuel, which yeah. just like filling up the gas tank when you're on a long car, car ride, you know, you For need sure. to pop it off. Yeah. I know in college, we always had all the snacks um, at halftime and I probably ate more snacks than I should have when I didn't play very much. I was like, Oh, fruit snacks, let's shovel these in my mouth. And then yeah. And I didn't well, even that's play always, minutes, but. That's always what happens, right? The, the athletes that are playing yeah. don't get a chance to eat. Right. Um, and that's okay. If, if you are uh, having some bench time, that's okay. If you are <laughs> snacking, that's okay. But it's a funny, like cultural shift of like, wait, are these snacks here for snacks or as fuel? <laughs> right. Sometimes I, a little guilty confession here sometimes, and I'm not the only one on my team sitting on the bench. We would, we would stuff our pockets with some of the snacks and just kind of like pop them in during the game when, it, when I knew I wasn't going to get like a ton of time. So yeah, yeah I'm sure I'm not the only one who's ever done that. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, cool. So as we kind of, I, I want to hear a little bit more uh, looking at your website as we kind of wrap this up. I know I saw some eBooks on your website um, and then also you started a new podcast. So tell us a little bit about both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, man, I have, I have probably too many freebies and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I do have some eBooks that are geared towards a college athlete or parents of athletes on just, you know, the fundamentals of nutrition and how to fuel well. Um, and I also recently, um, I have a, a nice little handout on, on Red S specifically oh, that cool. relative energy deficiency in sport. So it's, if you go to my website, which is riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S, um, R E D S, then you can find that handout. And, um, and then my podcast is female athlete nutrition. So you can, um, just tune in and listen to a lot of these topics that Shay, you and I have chatted about today more in depth and, um, bringing in other guests as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about nutrition and, um, definitely the needs of female athletes in particular. That's my story, your story. And I think the story that has, hasn't had enough attention in these past few years. And you mentioned it actually in the beginning that, uh, for a few years, I've always worked in, in sports as a sports dietitian. I worked at the collegiate level, but then I spent a few years where I was working as the, uh, lead dietitian for air force special operations, which was an all male environment. Uh -huh. And it, which was really fun, really cool. Cause it was very, uh -huh level, uh, type of athlete, different type of athlete, but really great job. But when I kind of, when I was done with that job, I was like, I gotta get back to, to girls <laughs> and women because uh, it's just, the needs are so different and it's, they're not highlighted enough. So those, that's the thing that I'm trying to bring attention to on my podcast, female athlete nutrition podcast is just, um, the, the topics that we don't talk about enough. The diet industry just talks about dieting and losing weight. And I want to teach girls and women how to fuel their bodies to be the best athletes they can be. And just, just live lives where they are confident and happy with their nutrition and their bodies. I love that. Yeah. And when I was looking at your site, I noticed the book just cause I know someone will probably ask this. So I'll ask you right now. Um, the book is like the title is like for runners, right? Yeah. 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 But I'm assuming that it's relevant for any sport, correct? Totally. Yeah. So when I started my business, I was kind of targeting runners because I'm a runner. Right. But as I told you in the beginning, I'm, I'm yeah. all athletes and all my clients are all athletes. So, yeah. Um, yes. but yeah, the website is riseupnutritionrun.com because the other riseupnutrition.com is already taken. <laughs> okay. I'll make sure I'll put that in the show notes. Um, I'll put the, your podcast. So female athlete nutrition is the name of the podcast. Yeah. Easy enough to remember. Awesome. Yeah. And then where, where else can, can people connect you or connect you connect with you, um, and learn more about what you do? I'm sure I know you're on social, so drop those and wherever yeah. else you want to send people. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really active on Instagram. I'm at lindsay.riseupnutrition. And um, I also have a Facebook group. It's the Female Athlete Nutrition. So the same as the podcast name. And that group is growing quite a bit. Um, join whichever social media is better suited to you. I know a lot of my clients that are kind of, um, you know, high school, college age are on Instagram. And then a lot of my parents or, or, 
our older female athlete clients are on Facebook. Um, so we're really active on both of those pages. Yeah. I always say parents go to Facebook athletes. You can hang out with me on Instagram, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. They, they each have their place. Awesome. Lindsay. Well, thank you so much. Like that was incredibly, incredibly informative. And I think you gave a lot of really great actionable advice and tips for athletes of any sport of any age, pretty much. Um, so thank you again for coming on and I appreciate you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So thanks for having me.